Manstein. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the first event in the fall 2022 series of City Talks on the theme of climate change and energy transitions in the city. My name is Jasmindra Jawanda, and I'm an urban planner, and I'm a planning consultant, and I am also a member of the UVic Committee for Urban Studies, which organizes the City Talks lecture series. I'd like to begin by first acknowledging that this event is taking place on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples, as well as to acknowledge the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanish peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I would also like to acknowledge the financial support of the Faculty of Social Sciences, Faculty of Engineering and Computer Science, Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Victoria, and the Legacy Art Gallery, which have all supported the City Talks. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Jan Director is a professor of geography and planning in the School of Urban Studies at the University of Washington, Tacoma. He holds a PhD in geography and environment from the London School of Economics and a master's degree in city and regional planning from Cornell University. His most recent books are Urban Sustainability Through Smart Growth, another one, Smart Transitions in City Regionalism, another one, The Urbanization of Green Internationalism, and Climate Change and the Future of Seattle. His current research focuses on keeping blue collars in green cities, especially at this as this involves questions of manufacturing. Again, keeping blue collars in green cities. Tonight, Jan will be giving a talk entitled Climate Change in the City Region, Seattle in Metropolitan Context. So let's give, a, give Jan, director, a very warm Victorian welcome to the City Talks. Within that. My topic is on the relationship between climate change and urban areas, and I, I put a kind of italics on my title, the end part, um, the relationship between climate change and cities, broadly understood. And uh, when I put together the proposal for Ruben and this amazing space that you've created, I want to say something about that in my talk. Uh, I was thinking about an African proverb that I, I, love, I sort of forgot about. And I looked up again, and, and it's this. It's a West African proverb of the Akan, or Ghana, and Ivory Coast. And they say that wisdom is like a large boabab tree. No one individual can embrace it. And it is meant to signal that uh, the humility I feel about not only the question of climate change, it's beginning to understand what that is about, but also, let me see if I can successfully do this. Okay. But also, um, uh, the question of cities. Uh, the issue of climate change is particularly important in the sciences, natural sciences. And so I want to draw your attention to one of the repositories of knowledge accumulation about implications of climate change for our region around the Salish Sea in the Pacific Northwest, the irony of more rain, more drought, the likelihood of inward salinization, uh, increased vector-borne, food-borne, and waterborne diseases, all sorts of urban drainage problems, uh, sea level rise of perhaps two feet, sorry, the imperial usage there, I should translate that. Perhaps as high as four feet, depending on the modeling, depending on geopolitics, depending on thousand variables that now I begin to understand. So I feel that any address talking about climate change, whether it's me or the other distinguished speakers in the series, um, our arms are only so big, and we can only get around that boabab tree so far. Um, it is perhaps the greatest challenge that our species is likely to face. 
and it requires oceanographers, meteorologists, geomorphologists, geographers, urban planners, architects, community activists, public officials, um, um, environmental engineers, and so on. It requires a linking of arms around this ginormous Boabab tree. That's hard enough, and I think you could certainly have invited a climate scientist to talk about any number of these impacts and what their likely effects are going to be on Victoria or Port Angeles or Tacoma or Seattle or Vancouver. Um, that's not my talk tonight, although I have to dip into that literature and try to understand as best I can, not as a climate scientist per se. Um, those of us in urban affairs are having a robust debate about what exactly the urban is. And I also I recognize that in my title, I, most of my work I talk about city regions or metropolitan areas or urban areas. And um, oh, sorry about that. that Just trying to adjust you a little the, bit. There we go. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, the iconic image of Seattle is, is Aside from the Space Needle is probably what functions as the modern agora of the city, which is a Pike Place Market. I'm sure most all of you have been there. And you could, you could ask questions about the urban through any scale or any space. I have my biases as an urban scholar, and I find it very, very difficult to think about any space without it being pushed out to wider relationships. And so Pike Place Market, for example, is to understand it requires one to engage with its history and understand its history means you're pushing out to the agro-food economy of the early part of the 20th century, which was inviting in uh, immigrants, from, particularly from uh, Italy and Japan, and that was an area that was strongly articulated into the reproduction of this iconic urban space. It was always a city regional space, in my view. Today, it, well, it lost that job in the 50s and 60s. Uh, when that economy evaporated and Boeing base expanded and changed the geography of the region. And that is now industry and warehouses instead of horticultural products that end up here in this uh, gore of Seattle. The urban can mean lots of things, but is it just the central cities at the metropolitan area? Are we talking about suburbs? Are we talking about small cities and towns outside those areas? Are we talking about all of those things? My tendency in my work has been to think about the urban as city regions. Um, and so my talk tonight will talk about Seattle in a, the, what I call a metropolitan context. I think anyone can push back on that, and that's a fair debate to have. Urbanists are actually even offering concepts like planetary urbanization, which is essentially saying that nowhere is essentially unrelated to the urban anymore. And that actually works its way into my talk a little bit too. So let's see if I can manage to change. To simplify or to get my arms around the relationship between cities or city regions and climate change, I'm offering a, a, a simple uh, numerical formulation, 541. And I, I hope that you leave with that. Um, I will talk a little bit, probably more about the five, and we'll maybe skip a little faster through the four. And of course, one is Seattle, but not just the municipality of Seattle, Seattle in its bioregional or metropolitan home. Um, and so what I mean by the 541 is this. Um, how do we think about urban climate action? I mean, what a remarkable state, what a remarkable phrase that is, we were just chatting before about urban climate action, still a relatively new concept, it seems, so it seems, where did it come from? How do we think about that? How should we leave tonight thinking about and I hope, I hope I can impart at least some ideas that you can consider and decide to reject or to amend or to work into your own thinking. Even when we offer a way of thinking about it, at what level of analysis should we approach it? And I'll say a little bit more about that, or perhaps I'll move through that a little faster. And then, of course, how does all that land in a community like Seattle, a community like Victoria, a community like Freiburg, Germany, or Cape Town, or anywhere? How do we relate these things to our own worlds, our own communities? And so this is the gist of my presentation. I'll be going through 541, um, if, I, if I can put it that way. Oh, I should say, um, before I leave the screen, um, the five is particularly interesting to 
roll out tonight because there will be relationships to the third speaker that you're having in the series, and that's David Moore, who is running C40 Cities, and they are closely associated with a group called Urban Climate Change Research Network. And the final book project came out of um, relationship with them, and I'll talk a little bit about it. So there is uh, uh, some links, I hope, to other speakers. The seeing Seattle in the regional context, I think, also has relationships to the second speaker in seeing um, uh, these issues from a regional perspective. And so I hope my thoughts tonight, while interesting on their own, will also perhaps reverberate with other speakers in the series, and then you put together just this really interesting repository where people from the community can come and we can have a conversation about it uh, when I finish. Um, so in the main, I'll be talking about some of the ideas in, in the wonderful introduction that was given on climate change and the future of Seattle. But, oh, the pandemic has been hard. We haven't been able to talk about anything with our neighbors for so long. We've been in our, our living rooms, our bedrooms, and we didn't get to go out and talk about things. And I can't tell you how excited I was Ruben to receive an invitation and cross the border and go spend time with people in different cities to talk about it these ideas, and so I want to um, also draw a little bit, if I might, on some of my other work, which has informed, informed how I think about this, and you know, for good or for ill, and in particular the book, The Urbanization of Green Internationalism, um, also a little bit from, from the book on more about urban sustainability. This book is a longer book just about Seattle, and then the final one is about sort of the smart city. You've heard this term, the smart city term, and how that might, might be influencing city regions around the world. The last one talks about uh, two cities in South Africa, four cities in Europe, the Seattle region, and Vancouver. Oh dear. Um, so I have longstanding interests um, across uh, the US Canadian border. And I would like to do so much more. And I'm hopeful that uh, after I sit down with my Bella chat about what's going on here uh, in Victoria. And uh, I look forward to that. Um, you're probably wondering, what is the five behind there? What is the five behind um, urban climate action? I'm going to hold you in suspense for just a little while. Um, I want to first lay out this idea that uh, the relationship to the levels of analysis we think about the ideas that have informed urban climate action, it's much harder to say this is when it started. In my summary that's on, I think, on the poster here, I, I dated to the 1970s, which other scholars might contest, and that's fine. I'm willing to have that debate with them. So to steal myself for that debate a little bit, I thought it would be helpful for us to remember some people that perhaps have forgotten. Um, one is, um, this fascinating late 19th century scientist who had the wherewithal to realize in the 1890s that the carbonization of industrial capitalism that was still relatively fresh in the world at that time was going to be a problem. And he actually sat down and calculated by hand what he thought might happen if we continued to pump carbon in the atmosphere. And I think, he, I think in some of his work, he predicted it would be three to four degrees centigrade. Remarkable, right? Um, that long ago, he won a Nobel Prize, not for his work on those calculations, but for other work in physics. But um, he was concerned with, with carbon emissions um, when no one else was, and he was a lonely guy. No one was listening to him, no one paying attention to many awards for it. He wasn't asked to give any talks in, in beautiful art galleries about the impending carbon crisis. Uh, nobody noticed his work until the 1950s when scientists started picking it up. And certainly, politically, nobody, nobody really paid attention to this until the 70s and 1980s, of course. So it might take a long time for an idea to matter. But we, I think as academics, believe and, um, we like ideas because we think at some point, if we believe in them, they will matter. The other figure I want to uh, draw attention to as a progenitor of these ideas this is the great uh, figure Patrick Gaze, who is a really important figure in planning history, a Scottish, uh, very odd, strange, interesting, fascinating person. 
is difficult to categorize. We had too many ideas, but I think two that are particularly relevant tonight. One was uh, regionalism. He's argued that cities should be seen in their regional context, which is a very uh, uh, attractive idea to me for lots of reasons. They're not important for this talk. Um, but the other one, I think, is relevant for the space that we're in and the series that you've created here. You had this idea of civics like a, uh, as a notion that he would have loved what's happening tonight. He would have loved this, this series that's happening now, the series that happened in previous years on themes and topics of interest. He would have loved that it was happening in an art gallery and it was free and open to the public. And he would have loved the fact that it's recorded that people can participate. And he called this idea civics. And he thought that it would matter in planning, that it would matter in politics. And uh, I think his ideas um, matter for how we uh, think about uh, the relation between global climate change and the homes we live in, our cities, you know, bioregions. Um, the interesting, uh, they, were, they, they lived at the same time in history. They occupied the earth at the same time. And I doubt they ever met, and they probably didn't know of each other's ideas. They were running in parallel with one another until their ideas met up, I think, later, perhaps in Portland in the 1960s, perhaps in Cape Town in the 1990s. I find that fascinating. So intellectual history of urban cl climate action is always an onion. You, you, you keep peeling away. You can say, well, there were ideas that they were drawing on, all right. So we could argue that it was there to be seen for quite a long time, but no one, no one saw it. We started seeing um, the ideas <clears throat> when institutions took them seriously. And so we see a local connection as well to um, British Columbia in the establishment of uh, two very important institutions in what I'm calling green internationals. One is, of course, the United Nations Environment Program, which was established in the capital of this new post-colonial African country of Kenya, an exciting time, just a few years away from kicking the British out and starting their own country and the United Nations put uh, the environment on the map and put it in the global south, put it in Nairobi. And uh, then, a few years later, they co-located with the United Nations Environment Program, UN Habitat, which is the international institution that does so much of the work of studying what's happening in urban habitats around the world, in Victoria, in Seattle, Los Angeles, in Nairobi, in Cape Town, in Mumbai, and so on. And <clears throat> I find it fascinating that they were co-located in the same building. I actually visited this, um, I visited UNAP as a, a much younger man, I'm afraid, um, when I was an uh, undergraduate student, um, not long, not that long after it was established. I was so excited, I guess, and it's always, it's always been with me. Um, the, uh, a local link here for British Columbians is, is the fact that um, the, the conference, the United Nations conference that created this new international institution was actually in Vancouver in 1976. And it was um, uh, Maurice Strong was all over this. I, I, is Maurice Strong still alive? I think he might have passed away a couple years ago, the great Canadian international environmentalist and oil magnate from Alberta. So, Contradictions are so interesting. Um, so this conference was held in Vancouver, bringing the world to British Columbia, um, reverberated back and helped to create these international institutions, uh, particularly the urbanization of, of the United Nations. The United Nations wasn't particularly focused on urban issues until the 1970s. And then we began to develop global expertise around it. And then um, UNEP has continued to be a repository for discussions around what matters. And so this is, um, for about 20 years, I think, they've also been uh, trying to think about and study and learn from indigeneity and intergenerational experiences and observations and insights um, of indigenous populations around the world. And this is absolutely relevant when I think about the Seattle 
in the anthropology region, and I think I mean, any number of figures, but this is Billy Frank Jr., his impact on environmental um, politics in the state of Washington is enormous. If you pass from Tacoma on the way past Olympia, you pass through the Nisqually Nation, which he's from. And um, so in thinking about Seattle's engagement with environmental politics, it's very hard to think about that without full engagement of um, uh, urban indigenous nations. My campus sits on the Puyallup, for example. We recognized that earlier in the presentation today. I think that's a weakness in my work. I think I haven't engaged with it nearly enough. Uh, I didn't include much of it in my last book, and I think it can be criticized. Right? Uh, any book is essentially a, a series of sins by omission. Uh, what you're most worried about when you write is a sin of commission. Did I get something wrong? Uh, but mostly you have to leave things out, and so it's a difficult thing to do, and so your arms only go around the tree so far, and you have to make decisions. And so I did make decisions. Right? We finally get to the point uh, where we can start to talk about the clear and legible urban climate action movement. And I'm going to narrow my comments exclusively to the states, um, with, that, with some references to um, a Canada, where I feel comfortable making them. But I think um, the first city in the United States um, to have a clear plan to reduce carbon was Portland in the early 1990s, pretty much ahead of everybody else. And that shouldn't surprise anybody in urban affairs. Uh, Portland has been leading on many, many issues. The thing about change is it's spatially and temporally uneven. It's still happening. So Columbus, Ohio has just recently <laughs> decided to have a climate action plan 30 years later after the first season. So just because it starts doesn't mean it's significant. Just because somebody in the 1890s said carbon's going to be a problem, does anybody else notice? So this has been a, a diffusion of action and activity over the last 30 years in the United States, including a very big city. Columbus is actually bigger than Seattle. Only now getting serious about climate action uh, at the municipal scale. Meanwhile, in the middle of that, I don't remember to do that, uh, we can locate uh, our communities in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Seattle, along with Toronto, and under the leadership of Mayor Miller, will be coming. I'm plugging him a lot in my speech because I think I'm trying to talk myself into coming back to see him. So, uh, um, I really admire a lot of what he's done. So I'm really eager to hear what he has to say. I also just reviewed his book for internal. Um, Seattle and Toronto at the same time, 2006, had a standalone statement about what they were going to do to decarbonize their community. And 2006, um, decades and decades and decades after our Swedish scientists uh, recognized that this could be a problem. Um, I note that the Capital Regional District here, which I'm really interested in, and I hope we can have some, I didn't know if there might be somebody from here, um, but uh, they signed the British Columbia Climate Action Charter in 2008. So in those sort of mid knots you start to see a lot of hum, a lot of buzz, and you start to see what I call the rise of cities in global ecological politics. And there's real reasons for that. In the States, um, Seattle enters the story for a very discreet reason. Uh, George Bush used to be president of the United States, who now looks relatively okay compared to some of the other ones we've had, uh, pulled the United States out of the Kyoto Agreement as Trump pulled the United States out of Paris. But the first time that happened, the federal government says, we're out of here, we're not going to act at the federal level. Uh, Greg Nichols, the mayor of Seattle, started getting on the phone and, phone and he started phoning other mayors of large cities and, and so we got to do something. He started something called Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement. And he said, well, if the federal government is going to do it, then we're going we're to see what we can do. And he created a kind of new urban network green movement that fairly quickly had about a thousand cities signed up. That's when it got my attention. I just moved uh, to the region in 2001, a 
couple years later, George Bush pulls us out of uh, Kyoto agreements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, national agreement. Mayors enter the story now in, in a way we hadn't seen before. And I find this fascinating. The, the, yeah, the notion of green mayor, and more than that, one of the things I argue in the book, mayoral offices have been greened. We now expect whoever occupies those offices to have something to say about climate change. It's a remarkable change in how we see the office of a mayor, particularly strong mayors with executive powers, like the mayor of Seattle or the mayor of Toronto. They have to be green international actors. They have to have something to say, and they have to hire people that have the ability to speak to that. And I think that's been a significant development in municipal politics in the last 20 years. Or even 15 years, or if you're in Columbus, last year, right? It's an ongoing thing. I noticed it, and I got curious about it. And so I, I wrote a paper a number of years ago. I was like, I wonder, I wonder who's doing this. What's the geography of this? And so I started thinking about my home, the Seattle metropolitan region, and other homes. And it pretty, pretty quickly became clear to me that, um, let's see if I can do this, I studied other cities, that this was primarily the core cities, or I'm calling the primate cities, the big, the big cities in the center of the metropolitan regions that were the early actors. And so I looked at uh, Maryland, and that's Baltimore, and so Baltimore is in early. We've got to do something about climate change. We're going to sign this agreement. We've got to set this in motion. Um, crickets in the suburban areas. Same pattern in Atlanta. Atlanta, early adopter, um, all in. Um, let's get going on climate change. The federal government is doing nothing. It's just catastrophic. This is serious. Why were core cities, big cities, Baltimore, Atlanta, Seattle, Portland, and so on, why did they suddenly think it was their responsibility? particularly when everybody else wasn't doing anything. There was a lot of free riding off of their carbon work. It's a fascinating research question. Um, and I also looked at our own region, and I noticed that whilst Seattle certainly uh, was the leader here, we did see a little more activity on the suburban fringe. If you know the region, that part of King County is Redmond, you know, Bellevue, that's high-tech, uh, informational capitalism. These are cities. They're not, they're not suburbs at all. They're cities. And so what I started to think about was um, the relationship of the economic structure of a regional economy and climate action. And I started thinking about uh, relative, the, why is it that communities, they're, they're, they're located where we, we think of suburbs as being, but they're not suburbs, they're cities. Bellevue's a city, Redmond's a city, Renton's a city. And um, they have very high uh, economic intensity. And other researchers have picked this up and, and explored this in other regions. And that was how I, I, I first got interested in this. It wasn't necessarily around the, the kind of research that climate impacts group is doing on inward salinization, on the fact that new species are showing up on the shores of Victoria, that the old familiar tree canopies is certainly going to change, that uh, environmental engineers are terrified about what all this means for structures that were built for climate 50, 60, 70 years ago, um, and so on. All the high quality real estate is going to be two feet underwater. All these issues that you read about. This was more related to um, who was adopting uh, climate, what, why? Was it for environmental reasons? Or was it for uh, well, our economy shift in a way that makes sense for us to position ourselves in this new global green uh, accumulation? Um, the other thing that was happening was, whilst the mayor of Seattle was building a national network, the big mayors of London and New York and Barcelona and other places were building transnational carbon action networks. And the biggest one of all is, is probably C40. I won't say much about that because you'll have the speaker who is running that. Uh, and I, so I'm really curious. But there, we saw in the last 15 years an absolute explosion of new kinds of 
of international actors. Cities engaging in global green diplomacy, cities demanding tables at the United Nations in a new kind of way, and um, particularly the biggest cities, the London, New York, Vancouver, Seattle, San Francisco, Toronto, um, Cape Town, Quito, those cities were, were seeing uh, more flow across themselves and seeing more in common with each other than sometimes within their own country. Mm -hmm. And you started to see a lot of teaching and learning. So there's been a lot of research on these new urban green international networks that are singularly motivated by climate change and the severity of it and taking on the role of wanting to do something about it. And You'll be getting an argument, I think, later this fall about while well, nations are doing nothing, cities are acting. And well, let's we can discuss that if you want, uh, or you can that more later. Um, so the, the 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 gist of the argument I make in the Green Internationalism book is it's simply impossible at this stage in 2022 to analyze the global politics of the environment without a very careful consideration of how it's changing cities and how cities are changing it. This and in the title. I think cities are uh, more important now than they have probably have been for five or 600 years. And that's before the nation state. There are all sorts of other ways of organizing the world aside from nation states. This is, in fact, a relatively recent political geography. There are all sorts of uh, urban leagues, the city-states of northern Italy, there was the Hansa League, and in, in northern Europe, there was the ancient Delian League in ancient Greece. These are intercity networks, um, and there were city regions, and a different model of global politics. And it's really interesting to think about that, particularly as the nation-state creaks a bit, and is showing the strain of, of, of time and some of the new pressures. It's not the topic of this talk, but I'm completely fascinated by that. Um, and the other point, point about that is the, how do we explain the rise of right-wing populism in the places that don't matter, as Andres Vegas posed it, Spanish geographer, is um, And this is part of it, too. So that book looks at um, city regions around the world and tries to ask uh, about how of this variation is playing out at the world scale, and, and in Cape Town, in, in Los Angeles, in Melbourne, and so on. And so if you're interested in having trouble sleeping at night, you can dip into that book. You know. But it's, um, it is a new thing, and I'm really fascinated by it. And you'll see that the middle map there is a more recent map of the patterning that we saw earlier, 10 years ago, in, in Baltimore. And it's really LA and a few kind of edge cities that are doing this and a lot of suburban inaction. And, and, and this really matters if you believe that cities are, are have become regional economies uh, for urban climate action. And I think that's the next thing we have to push. That's the next thing. That's what I would push Mayor Miller on. What is C40 doing with this? Um, it's fine that New York City and, and Vancouver and Seattle on their own, but what about everybody else around them that don't live in close cities but are not farmers, not milk cows in the morning, they live in suburbs of great variety, immigrant suburbs, wealthy suburbs, poor suburbs, blue collar suburbs, where are they in this story? And I think that's kind of the one of the arguments I'm going to be making here. Um, so finally, um, the book itself, um, and the famous five. How do we think about urban climate action? And I'm uh, calling out my use of the Urban Climate Change Research Network, which is actually housed at the uh, Columbia University. It's a whole collection of people there and around the world that are arguing that climate change will be solved or not by cities. And the way we support cities national institutions, provincial governments, uh, or federal governments, and so on, but it's going to have to be in cities because we are now 80% um, urban species. And cities are the problem, cities are the solution. 
And so here it is. Um, the Urban Climate Change Research Network says we ought to focus on five things. This is a way of an argument, isn't it? It's a claim. And, it, and certainly it's contestable. So well, why are those five things and not other things? Um, the first is um, better integrating mitigation with adaptation. The early plans I was mentioning, they're all mitigation plans. We've got to mitigate our carbon load to the atmosphere. What you see in more recent plans is, okay, we're going to have to adapt to the reality that we're failing. Right? So how can we continue to mitigate carbon in ways that also allow us to adapt our urban environments to the reality of climate change? And um, that's a slightly different challenge than just mitigation. Right? Um, the adaptation, the adapting to the reality of climate change also is important. These are, these are hundreds if not thousands of climate, uh, uh, climate scientists and, and climate scholars climate um, managers around the world thinking about this. They say we need a better job of understanding um, disaster risk reduction and our adaptation policies. Just look at what's happening in Florida today. They're getting absolutely hammered. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how resilient or not they are. It's just another hurricane. Um, it's just another day in Florida. Uh, but they got a good governor, so they'll sort um, the other uh, phalanx, or you march your armies in five directions at once if you use a military metaphor. Um, the other is, is what uh, a fancy term for what Getty's called civics. Um, we now use this term for co-generation, which is kind of what we're hopefully going to be doing here tonight. We're kind of what the university is doing in the city, uh, in welcoming citizens to come in, to talk, report it, to memorialize it to have students in Washington watch some of these talks, to have students in Mumbai watch some of these talks, and to learn and challenge each other, to co-generate our understanding of our risks in our communities, to, to draw on different forms of knowledge, not just formal technical knowledge, place knowledge, lived knowledge, the knowledge that comes just from years of living in a community. How does that get into our, our understanding of, of climate change? Um, I talk up here about their emphasis on networks. And I, I mentioned Seattle's been pretty active in that. And so I think that it deserves some credit for helping to build these new climate action networks. It's been a leader in that regard. I actually say in the book, um, other than New York City, I think it's been the most active networker in, in the US urban system. Um, I don't know if I'm right about that, but I'm willing to have a discussion about it. Um, and then finally, uh, the, uh, the focusing uh, particularly on disadvantaged populations. And that's the frame. And underneath it, you're looking at how the integration policies, planning systems, um, the equity um, uh, theme, uh, and how it rolls out throughout the system. And then, how do I pay for it? The financing of it. Who pays for it? How do we pay for it? Um, what is it going to take? What sort of investments do we need to make? What are the redistributive implications of that? And so on. Um, so inside that uh, five, that pentagon is, is probably the case. This is metaphoric and not quantitative. I didn't actually quantify this. I just was using this as a kind of metaphor. The cities do different things better and, than other cities, and they do things worse than other cities. Each, the Victoria does things very, very well. And it probably does other things not as well as some other region. And um, how well are they doing on disadvantaged populations? How well are they doing on the disaster risk reduction? How well are they doing on financing this? That we need a better understanding in this research network, how different cities around the world might be performing. What's their sort of urban climate action footprint? And this kind of gives us a way of thinking about that, one way to think and I, there's a lot of work to be done. I've been thinking about this, how to actually turn that into a real, uh, a real tool to measure um, progress. Um, so the book itself, um, sorry about all the words, but you know, we're weird these professors are. Um, the one area where I have a lot of words, and it's this, the, the core argument of the book, is that Seattle, uh, for a long time, has marketed itself as the Emerald City, but it isn't an Emerald City, it's an elite Emerald. I call it an elite emerald. Um, 
it is uh, it is profoundly uncomfortable with that. Right? It knows it's an elite emerald. And I think there's a lot of evidence of trying to do something about that. So it's on the one hand worried about the Pentagon, uh, the urban transformation Pentagon, but it's also worried about um, a space economy that has favored what um, the Los Angeles based geographer Alan Scott calls the cognitariat of Seattle. And, um, and the pulling part of Seattle. And particularly for middle and low income households and communities of color. Um, those two, those two parts are, are, are stood out to me in researching this book. Um, it is, it, it knows it's an elite emerald, and it's worried about what that means for the future of the city. And I think there's some evidence that others are are are, are arguing the same thing. I just noticed a recent report um, from the Berkeley Institution in Washington D.C. Um, that have, do a lot of great research on uh, metropolitan areas. And they really focus more narrowly just on the quality of plants. And they analyzed plants, and they took the top 50 U.S. cities, and they sort of ranked them in, in a more quantitative way than I did in my book uh, with Seattle. And they uh, point out uh, in their work uh, that I mean, you know, they develop a, a, a system that is subject to criticism, and we could, we could explore how they do it, and, and why you should do this, and why should you rank, and, and all of that, but they do it. And, and they point out a, a very strong, they get a very strong score on the detail and concern and care um, and operational uh, wherewithal, call it that, uh, attending uh, equity in a carbon plant, and that's consistent to, with what I was seeing. Um, on the other hand, and, and also, you know, great score on really detailed sector strategies to deal with transportation, energy, housing, and so on that you see in, in local government, and a very poor score in financing. Well, that other communities actually did better with that and didn't do as well on equity. And so again, that idea that different communities may be doing things really well in one area but aren't as good at and we need to understand that. And I think these networks of teaching and learning are important because they facilitate conversations like the one we're having here, a little less hierarchical than what we're having at the moment, but where people of different communities come together and start to compare notes. How is it you're able to do that? Uh, what did you learn on that journey? How, what worked for you? And, and I do think there's a lot of teaching and learning in these networks, although it's on. We can analyze, and I'll go through the next one a little faster uh, I think in, in, in the interest of time and in getting to our conversation. The level of analysis, what I mean by that is all of the comments, uh, we, we can analyze them um, at, at four levels. I call them the four P's. And I think academics, students of urban climate change um, are obliged to think at four levels. Um, they're, not, they're only analytically separate. In reality, it's more like a marble cake. You know, it sort of moves around so that any project you look at, sorry, it did get it did get changed around a little bit in the emailing thing. Um, a project is the thing that most of us are interested in. The projects we see in our neighborhood, the bike lanes and and the the new green roof that we see in a municipal building, or these are the things that get us up in the point. This is most of us as professionals, whether I work on projects most of the time. You know, a little thing here, a little thing there, I gotta get that done. Um, we are we are our daily life. But projects come from somewhere. They come from policies. Somebody's policies. And the policies come out of some sort of political struggle. And the political struggle is a struggle over worldviews. How how what is important in the world? And and you can see all these things if you look for them in a project. So it's not just the ivory tower. PhD in the office of the university. It's actually projects are worldviews in motion. They are concretized, real, consequential things. And nobody understands that better uh, than um, people that want to appoint judges to courts. Ideas really, really matter, and they matter in a practical way. They can take away your rights or they can expand. These um, philosophies and how we can think about them 
Uh, I've drawn quite a bit of my work from, uh, um, uh, from this book, Paths to a Green World, which I can recommend. It's like getting a little old now, but um, uh, it's still really good, I think. And thinking about philosophies. And um, these are, the, these are the, the four sort of philosophical debates that they say we're having about moving towards a green world. There's four groups. There's market liberals. There's institutionalists. There's bioenvironmentalists and there's social greens. And what do we mean by that? Market liberals, the argument is, if you let markets do what they do best, if you incentivize people through the profit um, uh, incentive, I should say, uh, they will innovate and they will give us the technologies that will uh, save the world. The institutionalists, while it's sympathetic with some of that, would say, well, markets have to be governed properly. They have to be regulated properly. We have to have the right institutions. Um, we need stronger international regimes, or we need, we need to strengthen municipal networks, or we need a different kind of zoning scheme for Victoria. Institutions are the thing. So this is political scientists and lawyers and public managers who believe that the public management, or the public management of markets is is what we need. And so a lot of the United Nations and, and getting agreements between countries is a belief that institutions matter. And if we get the institutions right, uh, we, can, we can make a dent in climate change. The bioenvironmentalists are ringing the bell as loud as possible. Right? They're focused on the actual uh, damage that's being done to the environment. And they're more radical uh, about uh, their concern. But they're not necessarily, there's tensions between them and, and they're scientists. They're the climate scientists. They're the, they're the people that are saying, here's what's happening to um, that atmospheric river that's coming our way um, in the next 20 years. Um, they're different from the social greens. They would lead with justice. They would lead with social justice first. And say so the problem is we have an unjust world and, and, and we should lead with that. And if we want to do something about what's happening in Seattle, we should be with that. These are really interesting sets of ideas. And they, uh, they occupy different parts of society, from chambers of commerce, to uh, nonprofit activist groups, to planning department, uh, to scientific holds of the University of Victoria, um, and, and the climate uh, impacts group of the University of Washington. And, and you can see these ideas, I think, you can see these ideas uh, in politics, and, and so when we think about Seattle, <coughs> what kind of city is Seattle? What are the politics of Seattle? And so, well, it's corporate shaped. Academics like the term neoliberal. Um, I, I prefer the term market liberal. Uh, and neoliberal for all sorts of reasons, which are not that interesting. But um, and then uh, yes, okay, I, I get that. That's possible. Seattle's a corporate city. This is the home of Jeff Bezos. We can see what's happened in South Lake Union in the last 25 years. Um, and then uh, activist radical, yeah, Battle in Seattle, 1999, George Floyd, Floyd protests a couple of years ago. Um, a very robust ecosystem of activist uh, agents in Seattle. Seattle's pretty, right? you know, and that seems like, yeah, I, I can see that. Um, a city that has a very strong planning orientation, a very strong orientation towards uh, planning processes, yeah, I can see that. And finally, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, um, the ecological consciousness that people like Billy Frank and others work so hard to be, yeah, I can see that. And so which is, you, you know, it's like when my grandfather asked him, want apple pie or cake, and he said yes, right? And it's all of those things. And um, it's not an invasion. Seattle's not a corporate town. It's not a town. It's not only an environmental green city, it's not only a city that likes to plan. It is actually, um, uh, when you see, you see, um, when you look at it, this is what you see, um, I'm trying to operate that. I'm not the only one who thinks that. This is a labor historian who wrote that uh, contemporary Seattle exists with a kind of dual personality. There's Boomtown Seattle, which has been re-engineered by billionaires, but Boomtown Seattle is also a progressive city, and it is, the loud echoes of all radical past. Um, and I, I, that got me thinking about understanding you know, Seattle in different kinds of ways, making sense of politics. 
I'm going to skip to this part, the fastest, the least, most theoretical, but it's, I use the term intercurrence, and it tries to capture the simultaneous nature of politics. That is the, um, there's multiple political orders in action, and that's how you make sense of politics of carbon action. Remember, we're interested in projects, we're interested in policies, we're interested in worldviews, but you also have to pay attention to the politics. How do you get these plans? How do you get them financed? How do you get to the neighborhoods? Who's at the table? That's the politics, and that's really important. I use this term, and I develop it in that book more extensively. I'll skip through it, but I talk about these competing sort of institutional orders, and I try and use that as a way to understand Seattle. I think it's perfectly possible to use that in Victoria, or Calgary, a city I spent some time in, or Cape Town, a city I spent a lot of time in, or anywhere. Um, so um, Seattle um, can be analyzed as a city, um, and just what's going on in there and how it's rearranging in spaces to, to sort of deal with climate action. Or, all of my point about pipe place market, it's very difficult analyzing about its, its connections, the way it's connected to rivers, the way it's connected to community flows, the way it's connected to um, uh, immigrant flows. It's just so hard, right? And so the book really struggles with that a little bit. I was asked to write a book about Seattle, and I kept pushing, I kept redefining Seattle as a metropolitan that relies on these operational landscapes around it to function. So, for example, um, it's been growing a lot, and so uh, not everyone can afford to live there who works there because of that, and so they have they get extruded out to the sort of frontier, which means if you don't have public transit, they have to drive to work, which increases the carbon loading. So Seattle can say, well, we're not doing it. We're pushing it out to the suburbs. You need to think about because functionally it is doing that, it's what it's functioning as, right? And so I looked at, um, in the book I look at um, how it's an uh, attempt to uh, build a, a new urban villages uh, look, and in the first map, uh, these urban villages, more mixed use, sort of smart growth, urbanism, combat cities, discourses that are very strong in planning studies. Um, you have a lot of mix and variety there, and it's therefore easier to support public transit and all these kinds of things. But much of Seattle, um, let me go backwards very quickly, is that light yellow. Light yellow in planning world is single family detached residential houses. And so a lot of people now in Seattle, Tacoma, and Olympia um, are asking whether the model of the 1990s, which was concentrating growth around these urban villages, is, is doable. And they're even talking about you know, eliminating single family zoning entirely. Uh, just eliminating it. Not eliminating single family homes, but limiting that nothing else can go in single family neighborhoods except for single family homes. That's a more radical idea, and that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, and that's where the rubber hits the road. And so Seattle is having that conversation, Tacoma's having that conversation, Olympia's having the conversation. And it's challenging this model of sustainability from the 1990s, because it's not the 1990s. It's the 2020s, and we have um, um, lots of problems. At the regional scale, again, quickly, I think it's a little short on time. At the regional scale, um, the way in which growth is being managed is trying to distribute that, again, across the metropolitan region. Seattle is, uh, is sitting in that. You see the early climate action map there in dark blue. The red are areas where we would like to funnel most of the next million people coming to the region. About a million people are coming to the region uh, in the next, by 2040, where are they going to go? And how will we support them? Um, and so that's the vision, and Seattle is embedded in that regional vision. And that makes it possible to then have conversations about uh, transit-oriented development. Um, and transit-oriented development yeah, across the region which will be necessary uh, to get people out of their cars. And Seattle's about 25% of its carbon loading is from cars. So if you're going to make a dent, Seattle at any rate, not saying New York City, New York City's problem is heating and cooling buildings. They get great mass transit. DC's got pretty good mass transit. Seattle's problem is really around transportation in particular to mitigate harm. So its strategies reflect that. All right, moving towards the conclusion. 
I think Seattle is making a sort of tantalizing progress. It's a progress that's developing its, its roots in um, environmentalism. The struggle over Pike Place Market, for example. Pike Place Market was ideal to sustainability in the 50s. It was uh, selling food, was, it, was, it was grown in the county to urban consumers, what we're trying to do with urban farmers markets. That went away, and it needed a new job. And the downtown business committee wanted to demolish the market and replace it with some modernist monstrosity. The committee pushed back, right? And it, it ignited um, one of the signature moments in the modernization of Seattle's politics. Seattle has an interesting history with race. Like most of the cities in the Northwest, it is majority white. My wife is from South Africa, and she, after a while, is a white up here. Yeah. It's, the Pacific Northwest cities are majority white. Tacoma, Seattle are all 67, 70% white. Not DC, not Baltimore, not Atlanta. Those are majority of black. Los Angeles and so on, Cape Town. Those are very diverse. Seattle's majority white. Um, and yet, um, it has been, uh, uh, it has a, a, a really interesting history with racial reconciliation. Um, yes, the Terrace was the first public housing estate in the United States to be racially integrated at a time in Boston, Chicago, were doing everything they could to. Uh, so it has a racial justice a tradition drawn. Um, and I think it also has a history of public ownership of public services. You know, in other words, an anti privatization. Public services should be owned by the public, and you see that. In Institutions like city said. So it has a lot of grassroots infrastructure to, to be a progressive city and make progress. And it did in this presentation, I particularly was talking about um, its, uh, its comprehensive planning, and its uh, early work on building networks, its uh, work on, on instituting climate plans, first mitigation, and later um, uh, adaptation more recently, and, and all that's good. At the same time, remember my overall argument, because it is, uh, in many, oh yeah, I should say, before I move on, one of the um, greenhouse gas inventories that was done a few years ago, uh, the, the quote of the federal, uh, a federal uh, official who said, Seattle's one of the most climate friendly cities in the nation. I got a question about that. According to their uh, study, uh, Seattle has reduced its carbon about 5% between the years 2006 and 2065%. And then you think, well, that doesn't sound like much. That's at a time when the city grew. Right? So on a per capita basis, the city, it reduced um, per capita emissions by about 20%. Um, that's about 4.3 metric tons of carbon equivalent gases every year. And the devil's in the details of how it did that. And that's again from the city. Um, and that's good. That's tantalizing progress. And it's like, okay, that's good, right? Um, it's not a dying city, it's a, it's a shrinking city. It's not a shrinking city. It was in the 70s, right? It is not anymore. And it's, it's reducing its, its carbon per capita, and that's good. It is um, doing all sorts of other really cool things. I'm really fascinated to, to learn if there's anything like this here. Building networks between cities to lobby the legislature. Um, sharing information at the regional level with one another. This is a group called K4C. It's uh, King County Cities Climate Collaboration. And I think this is really interesting. It's not about international networks. It's not about even national networks. It's about cities within regions working together, as well as a lot of evidence of some pretty impressive thinking at good old fashioned public utilities, you know, like Seattle Public Utilities. Um, they, they've done a lot of great work. Uh, not enough time. As it, as it does all that, its problems are enormous. The, the bar chart there shows the sh upward shift in wealth. You know, so it's getting to be wealthier, and all that wealth is turning into nice restaurants, and expensive housing, extrusion, the complete collapse of the African American community in the Central District, the extrusion of those people to um, uh, the Air Pacific and Tuckwell and other places. Um, the investment in transportation as um, the risk of displacement is very high. And you have to do something else to keep that from happening. So this is a, a risk displacement map. Remember we talked about risk. What is the risk? And then um, the final one is something you all see all the time, and that is uh, 
Well, you don't see it as you're going down Interstate 5, but you don't see the hundreds of homeless camps underneath you as you're driving by belching wonderful fumes onto those camps. And that is the most visible expression of exclusion and inequality that you see in San Francisco, in Olympia, in Tacoma, in Seattle, and other cities in America uh, that is deeply disturbing. And so those are its problems, those are its challenges, tantalizing progress, real problems uh, around justice. It's aware of the homeless camps under I-5. It's aware that income is shifting up and away from middle and low income. It's aware that as invest in transit, the risk of displacement is very high, and it's thinking very hard about uh, what to do about it. <laughs> and, and so I, I don't want to say either that you know, Seattle is this bastard case, it's completely a lead emerald, or that it's as progressive a city as it like to think it is. It's struggling. It's struggling with this. And I think in that struggle, there's a lot to learn. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm really interested in going forward with this research in um, that last point. And I'm interested in what's happened to Western societies. Uh, we just had an election in Italy, which is deeply concerning. Uh, we just had an election in Sweden, which is deeply concerning. There has been, we live in a time of right-wing populist revolt. This is the most important social movement politically in the world in the last 10 years. And I think those of us who care about uh, environmentally sustainable social just cities have to respond to that. Somehow positively. Yeah. And so my work right now is under the title Keep, Keeping Blue Collars in Green Cities. And particularly, I think it's interesting to think about that. Um, post-pandemic, with a lot of discussion of reshoring and the role of fabrication and making things again. And um, this conversation is, is starting to become very interesting in Washington State, but it's being led in part by a nonprofit based in Vancouver, who's thinking especially, and I'm gonna skip forward because I don't want to do all this, uh, right here, um, thinking about uh, industrial symbiosis or industrial ecology, how what is an output becomes a round put, how the ways to sludge of one firm becomes an input to another firm. And I think this is also, in addition to regionalizing our understanding of urban climate action, and remembering Patrick Eddy's, and how civics are important to that, and how forms like this are important to that. I think another thing we need to be thinking about is working class folks and the role of manufacturing and, and, and those are good paying jobs and they evaporated in the 70s and 80s and that set the stage for a profound chasm between the cognitariat and the haves and the people with a million dollar homes in Capitol Hill and those that are not experiencing that in America or that Canada or that Sweden or that Italy or that Britain and it's a pattern everywhere so I think on our side Ledger. We have to come back with things. And I think this is one of the ways to do that. Think about how manufacturing, blue collar work, the making of things, manufacturing, of course, comes from a mom, your hands, making things. Rather than a city that's built for the commentarian and making their life easier, how do we take these ideas into the, the blue collar world? How can we go into that world? How can we have the conversations with blue collar working class people? And I'll end with a vignette. It's um, my colleague and I are working on this project now. Both of us had the same experience. We were backing up our uh, cars into backwards parking, and we both had the experience of, of, of anger from somebody else. You know, they didn't want that kind of space. They didn't want to have to do that. They didn't like this, and they're angry about it, and they're upset about it, and they let us know. And uh, do we not talk to these people? Do we dismiss these people? Uh, I think that that's, that's our struggle as a political struggle going forward. I think urban climate action is, is got to find ways to respond uh, to that. And I think this is, this is perhaps one way. And so the Vancouver-based uh, uh, group is, is thinking, helping Washington State and Seattle area think about industrial ecology. They're also working in Vancouver and they're working in, uh, in, in Alberta. And so there's a lot of wonderful things to study there too. And with that, 
I thank you very much. Um, I'll close with another African proverb. Uh, the East Africans say, yeah, the fool speaks and the wise person listens. So now I want to be wise <laughs> and stop talking and listen to the wise guy. Silicon Valley, but it's like a trendy area that 
there's a lot of value added and things are better. It's areas that feel like this whole thing is not going well for us. Our, our kids are leaving our towns. Um, they're paying people to have to please stay and have children. You know? Those are the communities that are voting right. And I think um, the economy's not really working for them. They're not able to afford college. You know? When I went to university, um, I don't tell this to my students, but they're going to see this video later. When I went to college, it was $800, you know, a semester. And now it's $15,000, $20,000, dollars So all that stuff is like, this, is, this world's not built for people like me, and I'm mad. And they are voting. And um, we have, we can't, you can't say, well, you're just, you're a moron, you're an idiot, you're ill-informed. We have to come back with a positive response. I think the center lab, lab how do you think of yourself? has to have a, a rejoinder, and that's what we are. And I don't know where you are in, I think blue collars and green cities is maybe something like, yeah, we, we do care about blue collar work. We get a little bit of that with the pandemic with essential workers, and hospital workers and grocery store workers and all that, and it just kind of fades away. Any more questions on the floor? Yes? Okay, we have, sorry, the hand in the back first, and then this gentleman in front. Sir, we don't have the mic to circulate, oh, if you don't sorry. mind. Yeah, no um, I just also spent two years in Alberta uh, for grad school, and one thing I noticed, I was in Edmonton, but I think it's similar in Calgary, is um, those cities have, like, without a water boundary, basically end up being these very, very small downtown cores with then like huge sprawl, which is now sprawling into like really good farm, like really good soil and farmland. And it seems like that's happening at a pace that like there, it's just gonna happen before we realize that that is not a good template for a climate adapted city. And so like the, the barrier to like how you build transit systems for cities like that. And I guess I was just curious, because um, I'm sure Alberta is not the only place that's happening, what your thoughts are on that. I don't know <laughs> how you stitch together a, I think, uh, and Calgary is physically enormous, uh, in part because it, it annexed everything. And, and I think that's actually good, uh, because <laughs> uh, in the US we have a lot of political fragmentation. Area, Baltimore, every little tiny has their own municipality, and they put up their land, you know, ceiling and push it down. Um, Canadian cities aren't as fragmented politically as American cities, politically, on this level, but, you know, in the, in the Mountain West in particular, you have similar levels of, of, of low density residential development. It's exceedingly difficult to service with anything other than a car. So I don't know. And I don't know the planners know how to crack that nut. And so, but, but that's the preferred um, living arrangement. And it's partly preferred because it's been politically preferred for decades and you take off all the money in your taxes. And there's a million political reasons and political struggles why that's the case. And, 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 and all that, but I don't know. The answer is I don't know how we do that. I don't know how we can build a 600 square mile city and service it with anything but a private automobile that depends on occasional oil war um, to, <coughs> to keep going. These are oil schemes. That's what they are. They're just oil fields. We're getting late in the day, but is there any other? There is another is question. Any other Thank question? you. As a geographer, I was absolutely enthralled in the sense of place in your talk. Um, uh, my wife lives in West Seattle in the Alaska Junction neighborhood. Um, I just came back from it this weekend. Um, I um, uh, did spend five years in Columbus, Ohio, doing my PhD, my postdoc there at Ohio State, and then moved to Victoria in uh, 2021. And it made me think about kind of, um, first of all, it made me think about, you asked, like, well, what are things kind of like in Victoria? And I remember when I was, 
um, looking at apartments in the city. I lived out in the James Bay neighborhood, which is some of here, but I was looking at when I was trying to find a cheap place to live because the cost of living is expensive here. And I said, oh, there's an apartment in this place called Sandwichton that I could build in there, right? And I was like, oh, it's about a 25 minute commute from Munich. And I was talking to somebody who was from Victoria and I said, why in the world would you want to have a 25 minute commute to your job? And I was like, when we lived in Columbus, my wife and I, it was a 22-minute drive from our apartment in the far outer reaches of the city, um, which annexed everything around it to a parking lot in a, at Ohio State, right? I was like, I'm used to a 25-minute commute. I'm from Minneapolis, an hour commute is like kind of the average sort of thing, right? And so I was just kind of thinking about that, but you, you mentioned that Columbus uh, uh, came up with a climate plan, and I was kind of surprised, and I kind of chuckled a little bit inside because Columbus is a very sprawling city, which is, heavily carbon dependent, right? As a matter of fact, I'm in my former professor, now probably Harvey Miller would probably not be on with this for saying this. I, they've actually uh, gone back against transit, right? They just recently cut bus service. Now they cut it back a few hours and cut major urban routes to the through um, urban areas of the city and things. And yet they're developing a climate plan and I, and I kind of have trouble kind of reconciling like, well, how does a city that is almost enamored with the car like Columbus is becoming even more so, right? The new Intel factories being built outside the city and right. drive housing prices to the roof. How, in your mind, like, how does a city reconcile itself <laughs> with the climate plan while they seem to be doing everything in their, their power to like dig their heels in towards actually following the tenets of that plan of being That actually, mm -hmm. that's a good question, mm -hmm. um, for which I have no good answers. Um, uh, I was surprised, actually, that Columbus took that long. It, 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 I didn't, I was surprised. It's a big city. It's actually a huge, the central city is very big. And most big cities are, are doing it, which begs the question, why? I think in the Seattle case, there is this root structure around race and public ownership and environmentalism that kind of rings a little more true. Well, if you're adopting one now, why are you? Uh, what is the motivation? It may be different than the motivations in the 90s. Uh, I don't know. I'm, it, is, it is curious. Or it may be a recognition of what is the kind of city we are and, and they're projecting out the, uh, the capital improvements program for the next 30 years and they're, they're, they're dying because they know how much it's going to cost. I don't know. Um, yeah. There's another part, but. Thank you very much. I'm glad I touched on cities that you have lived in. Um, I had it planned all along. I knew somebody would be Columbus savvy in the audience in Victoria. I knew it. <laughs> That's amazing. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Good question. Really? Hi there. I really enjoyed your talk. And um, I was wondering, you mentioned different scales, the urban, the national, and the global, and how cities are developing urban networks to address climate change. I guess I'm wondering, how you see the kind of connections between those different scales. Um, there's a lot of attention to the international scale with the Kyoto Protocol and you know, the more recent agreements and things. Do you see, what role do you see in kind of connecting those different scales and the role that cities kind of play within that? Um, in the Green International book, I criticize a lot of the early enthusiasm for city networks and argued that the state actually has to be an active participant um, for all sorts of reasons, and they're forgetting about the state, which I mean usually the federal, in Canada, the US federal, or elsewhere. The, the traditional state structures have to be involved. So that's good, but um, I don't know, I don't really get to say what that means. Um, in the US, and I think also in Alberta, right, vis-a-vis -vis the federal government, tremendous tension um, and even light talk of secession that you only ever always associate with Quebec, right? Um, uh, the, the relationship between cities and their federal governments I think is, is a fascinating one and, we, and, and they have to be rethought. And so a one person who I think has thought about this more, much more than me is a Finnish geographer, Sandy Moisio who's talked about the geopolitics of, of the informational city. Um, and he's thinking about how governments are using their key cities in the international arena as sort of a new relationship. So I think his work is, is better 
um, on that. And I, I would recommend it to you about how the urban, the national, and international might be uh, are shifting in ways that are unfamiliar to us. We think of the federal government's up there, and the province is right there, and it really is a little tiny thing right there. And what I'm talking about here, and I think what Mayor Miller's going to talk about, is this, the assertiveness of Toronto and Seattle and London and the global stage. Um, and academics like Ben Barber writing books like If Mayors Rule the World. Well, this is a book that mayors like to read, <laughs> right? And uh, it's pushing, it's making the United Nations and national governments a little nervous. If you're the mayor of London, you're a really important person. If you're the mayor of New York City, you're really, you, those economies are much bigger than 20 states put together, right? And so it does make really interesting questions about what are the implications for what we're used to thinking about here in the early part of the century. Should we make it to the end of this century? Just because this has been the system in place the last 200 years doesn't mean it's going to be the same system in the next 50 to 70 years. And th things change not only do we get new things, but we do get new politics. For better or for worse. And yeah. unfortunately, <laughs> for those of us who are sort of organized, the last yeah. thing we wanted to see was a right-wing populist, neo-fascist development, so we can see we have to be honest and say, this is, this is real. Uh, there could be, uh, uh, should I say this with a video on? Oh, why not? Um, I don't think it's inconceivable the United States will break up in my life, and certainly my daughter's life. I don't. And I used to say to my Canadian friends, because I had Canadian, French Canadian housemates at one point in my life, five French Canadian um, architects. And I was very sensitive to fascinated in the early 1990s with those two razor thin boats. It's like, let me anybody from in Canada, right? And so I was always struck by that. It was fascinating to me. And, and I think that it could very much happen. I think Britain, very likely to break up. I think Italy could break up. Um, these, the, and, and who knows what that means? And I think it could reconfigure cities and how they feel about uh, their place in, in formerly familiar institutions. You live in interesting times. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming out on Wednesday night. Um, uh, I do think the space that the University of Victoria has created is really important. And uh, I hope you come for the other talks this fall. I certainly will watch them. If not, get on the ferry. This is you. And, uh, I wish you a good time. Meet them. behalf of City Talks. Thank you so much, Ellen, for the tantalizing talks. And uh, you left some gems for us in terms of the role of civics and cities and climate change and climate adaptation internationally and uh, regionally and, and from a North American context. Thank you so much on behalf of City Talks. I have some post-talk reminders. The next talk is October 27th, Christina Hoika. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, will be giving a talk entitled, Why Renewable Energy in the City is a Regional Issue. So thank you so much for showing up tonight, and we look forward to seeing you at our next City Talk. Be safe, be well. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.